Hey, everybody, it's John Ray, and I'm joined with Dr. Bob Baer at Deepwaters Recovery. And today we're going to be in conversation about a myriad of topics, the, the first of which is the big, massive concept of fulfillment. How do I get fulfilled in, in this life, Dr. Baer? Right, right. So <laughs> I don't know. I just uh, for, for those of you listening, I just spent a couple hours with my 20 year old daughter and I asked her, what, what do you think John and I should talk about today? And she said, fulfillment. And uh, uh, what she means by it is, is uh, I said, do you mean living a life of meaning <laughs> that has some meaning? And she said, just something that I'm passionate about, something that I can feel that's pulling me. She said, this is my 20 year old. And uh, I said, wow, that's it. We do have to find a way to talk about that today. Something yeah. that's in the world that's pulling me toward it, not because of my messages that say that I got to be a, I've got to do good or be good or do what they want me to do, you know? Yeah. It's, there's something that falls more into the spiritual realm, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I I think a lot of it for me has to do with you know, you all, you always hear what are the things that you do when when you're not at work? What what are the things that you naturally show up for? And so for me, that's writing in my journal every day, like writing letters to to friends and and family. Like like I I whether I need to or not, I find myself writing a lot, and and so that's a kind of expression that you you know. I like to key into because I know that it's something that I do almost on autopilot. It, it calls to me because I find it cathartic. I find it to be a, a great way for, for me to find clarity around some of my ideas. And, and so, you know, step one for me has always been, okay, at this phase in my life, like what are the thing when, when I have a free day, what are the things that I'm naturally gravitating towards? And can I build something around that? what what type of in in your own experience and those that you're working with what do you see mapping on to fulfillment like what's bringing people meaning yeah that's a topic that that uh, that i write about a lot in the creative fire there's the, the book the creative fire uh 10 weeks to emotional and creative fitness which john has magically turned into an online program that's going to that's uh, you're going to be able to punch a button here i think somewhere close to this video uh very soon which will take you to that but i've spent quite a bit of time in there because this follow your bliss idea that we've all heard and was nobody heard of it and then suddenly people started to hear about it and then it was a bumper sticker and then i saw it on refrigerator magnets <laughs> and now it's like everybody's heard follow your bliss right it's yeah. uh, actually came from uh, a guy named Joseph Campbell. Many of you might know he's a mythologist and uh, an, uh, early uh, in his life, he was also an associate of Carl Jung, uh, much respected academic person of depth, which all, don't always go together. Uh, that's why they don't teach about Carl Jung in univ most universities, because it takes a certain amount of depth to teach it. All right. Mm. So have I gone completely off track here with this? Oh, follow your bliss. So uh, yeah, the rest of that sentence is follow your bliss and doors will open that you didn't even know were there. Mm. Yeah. To me, that to me, that that is a, an incredibly important punchline that doesn't go on the refrigerator magnet usually, because uh, we think that we have to make it happen. That That's is right. the misnomer here. And I have it. Are you kidding? You and I were just talking about, oh, it's me. there's this building downtown and I've watched it go up and there's somebody there that's making that happen. It's an incredibly creative, but you better get a somebody in there to make that thing happen, right? It's, uh, <laughs> I have that in, we need one of those on our team, John. What the, you know, and John's going, oh, okay. Thanks for sharing, Bob. Take a breath. <laughs> you know, uh, that it, it is way more important. <laughs> yes, it's important to have a plan, follow through with it. Uh, even more important, if if we want satisfaction, if all you want is to build shit and and to uh, <laughs> to create products, then uh, this whole spiritual idea is, doesn't matter. But I, you know, building products has never satisfied anybody that I, in terms of peace and joy and depth and meaning and what my daughter calls fulfillment right yeah it's like yeah okay good job next job okay good job next job that's not the energy that i want 
in yeah. my life. What I want is uh, to uh, trust that this universe has doors that will open beautifully and I'll see uh, just, it, it, but I have to get still enough. And then this gets into your expertise, right? Mindfulness. I have to get still enough to let the waters uh, recede a bit so that I can even see these doors, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. I have to, and then it's also known as trust, trusting the universe. Yeah. Right? Is this a friendly universe, or is this, or or do I need to brace myself against it? What, what you and I were talking about earlier, the yeah. resistance that we have, we feel like we're waiting for it to be bad, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right, and you know, the, that resistance that gets mapped onto our ner nervous system, I feel like it puts blinders on us. And, you know, they, the I call it decision space. So we all think that we could think any thought at any time, but we actually have a pretty finite amount of thoughts that we can actually find in any given moment. And the more resistance or trauma or, or, turmoil that's happening in our body, the more narrow that decision space gets. And, and we end up in this kind of fight or flight, which we talked about in our last video scenario, where we're only seeing the immediate dangers in front of us. And, and we're acting from this like almost yeah. adrenaline driven state. And what the, the power of mindfulness and the reason that I you know, love to practice that more than anything. I feel like it's it's the practice that's brought me the most satisfaction and fulfillment is because when I can calm my nervous system down, release some of that resistance, release some of the attachment that I have to the outcomes that that I that I feel I need, that I'm clinched up about, just relax to that. What ends up happening is the decision space opens up. And all of a sudden, I can start to see the breadcrumb trail to where I want to get. And I think there's this idea that you that you know at one point you're just going to be in meditation and the entire plan comes to you and then you've got it. You you're enlightened and that and that's it. And my experience has been that fulfillment really is a breadcrumb experience. It, it's ooh, that was a juicy little nugget right there. And then that puts it, that, then you open up a new decision space. Ooh, that was a juicy little nugget there. And, and so each step in the path becomes its own source of satisfaction instead of the only thing that can be satisfying is when I get to the destination, which is where I was trapped in for many, many years. I, I felt like I was losing at life if I wasn't at the destination. And for me, practicing presence is about recognizing, oh, I can find I can find that peace and calm, that 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 place of curiosity for me is like a really satisfying place. Ooh, I'm really interested in this idea. And and I can find that by sitting with myself. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there's a there's a there's the development of the ability to tolerate change, right? Because yeah. when we're in that very narrow mind, we're just pounding away at making it make what make everything in life fit into whatever that is, right? So when things change, it like throws that. So we do everything we can to try to keep it uh, within those uh, guardrails. And it's uh, uh, that's why sometimes the idea of a vision of what I want in my life versus a goal. Goals are good as long as it's headed toward a vision that has meaning from a place of my deeper self, my deeper soul, uh, uh, a, a place that is uh, more authentic for me as opposed to uh, marching according to those messages that live at the very top of my, <laughs> I don't know how to talk about it really, nobody does, but it lives at the very top of my consciousness. The most superficial part of me is saying, hey, you got to get that done. You got to do this. You got to do that. And most yeah. of them are being run by the motor of trauma. And when I yeah, mean yeah. that, so I, I like to use the, the PTSD model, even though we all don't meet the uh, clinical criteria for PTSD, we all have the dynamics of it. And that dynamic is that uh, a trauma happens, right? Shit happens. And it can happen in a couple of different ways, several different ways. Most of them people don't see as trauma, but it does reroute who we are. Of course, abuse 
and uh, 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 shocking incidents. There's no, there's no uh, uh, controversy about whether those are trauma or not, right? Yeah. A, a little bit more controversy around abandonment and emotional abandonment, fathers who weren't there, moms who were smothering and, uh, you know, we, it's not about blaming anybody, but th if this stuff happened to us, it's in our body and it's stuck there and it's running a lot of the show. Also different ways of neglect, you know, it's living in 10 different places a year as a kid or wondering if we're going to eat or uh, where's the money going to come from, even though yeah. good, we're all from good families. Nobody meant to do any of that shit, right? We're all from good families, but we also also have to look at this stuff without blaming. And then there's enmeshment, which is we all were trying to balance out our dysfunctional families. And if you're not from a dysfunctional family, please write to me because I want to meet you. Uh, you're the first human I've heard of even that is not from a family that didn't have some dynamics that were out of balance. <clears throat> yeah. So when I say the PTSD model, I mean, we have been affected by these things. And what happens is we start telling ourselves things about the world based on that. And we start living our life that way. That's and, right. and what we're doing is uh, trying to arrange the world in this little bit of our short term. We're waiting for the bad shit to happen again. In other yeah. words, in PTSD, uh, for a war veteran, they're waiting for the bomb to go off again. So they can't even function. So you have to do some trauma work to help that, that calm down the short-term memory so that those things sink into deeper, uh, uh, the longer-term memory so they can even see, literally yeah. and figuratively, be able to even function in our lives. We have to calm down the trauma that's running these messages that are keeping us from seeing the doors of opportunity for us in our life. And we're, so almost everything that that is distressing in our life has an underpinning of unresolved trauma, right? Why can't I meditate? Well, I've got some stuff under there cooking. Why? And then the, all, the opposite is true too. Why can't I calm this? Well, I'm not willing to meditate, right? Yeah. So it, they, it's, it's kind of a vicious cycle. And we have to, one way or another, in the combination of doing our deeper work, and what I mean by that is getting into the body, coughing up the hairballs, being with... <laughs> being with so coughing up those emotional hairballs that have been stuck. And it takes, you know, this is probably a little transition at some point to another conversation that uh, we talked about having, which is about group dynamics and how that helps with uh, transformation of uh, unresolved trauma. But what we want to do is clear the screen and take a few breaths, literally and figuratively, and be able to see those doors that are That's there. Right. All of them are right there, right now. Synchronicity. Dr. Carl Jung talked about synchronicity. Wow, how did that happen? I, how could that have possibly happened? I didn't, I met the right person at the right, well, that right person probably would have been there anyway. <laughs> it's just, you wouldn't have seen it. You wouldn't have yeah. noticed it, right? Exactly. It's, uh, it's about clearing the screen so that we can see the magic in life, I, I think. I think that's right. And, you know, I I think that we assume that we're seeing everything in front of us, but our brain is really only picking out a finite amount of data points. And it's going to pick out the data points that match our expectation. And, yeah. you know, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and failure is a big part of, of an entrepreneur's kind of narrative arc. And if somebody has failed a lot, in, in business, they start to develop a defense mechanism that, oh, I've already tried that. I've already tried that. I've already tried that. And they did already try that from a different mindset, a different perspective, a different emotional tone. But, but as they, if, if we can put them in, in those scenarios and, and help them release some of the resistance that they have to doing that again, Anytime you're doing something a second, third time, if you if you can recognize what you learned from the first time and then iterate in, in the next edition, then you can bring something new to the scenario and you can open yourself up to seeing new data points and the same motion, the same action can play out very differently because now you have a new kind of site that isn't clouded by all of the unmet expectations and trauma um, tell, telling you that something is, isn't going to work. And, and I think that it's one of the reasons that, you know, 
in entrepreneurship, we, we always talk about, you know, fail, fail fast and, and, or fit, fail quickly, get up and, and keep trying be, because there, there is almost like an, a, a mentality that like an athlete would have where, uh, an athlete's not going to nail the the jump every single time but with enough practice with with enough muscle memory then those motions become very easy and one one of the things that um Dr. John DiMartini talks about is, is how the latin root of the word passion like everybody wants to be in their passion i want to find the thing that i'm passionate about but but the latin root of passion um actually means to suffer and, and and so your passion is the thing that you're willing to suffer through be, because there is, e even though it's blissful for you to achieve that thing, there, yeah. there, there's an amount of practice that has to happen. Like, like you, you can't expect to be the best in the world at something immediately. And, and so they, there are consistent motions that when done over time do, do, and that can be uncomfortable that can be the thing that you have to suffer through is just learning the those motions but to me mastering those motions that that then give you the the experience that you're wanting to have is such a satisfying experience um I, it's hard for me to believe you're in sales job <laughs> for so long because right now you're trying to sell suffering oh my god <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants suffering, John. What you're getting into my business now, right? I, 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 sometimes I think, what you know, what the two things that I sell are creative creativity. People are scared to shit of being um, uh, spontaneous, <laughs> spontaneous and real, and and making a mistake creatively, right? And the other thing is healing our pain. Nobody wants to feel pain. I should. Why don't I sell Nike shoes? But. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but on that topic is uh, the in the book, in the creative fire, there's a section in there that says, so follow your bliss, follow your bliss, follow your bliss. Okay, okay, okay. What is it? First of all, how do I even know what the hell it is? Most, uh, actually, I work in my private practice. I, most people don't know what it is. They're kind of sneaking up on it. And the, mm -hmm. uh, there's a, you know, the, the ways that I talk about it, the very best way is to, for me, is to think about, well, actually, it's a combination of these things. So the things that have kept you up late at night, or like you were saying, you find yourself doing, uh, whether you're being employed for it, or whether there's a project you're doing or not, right? It's the yeah. combination of that and things, projects that you've worked on that kept you up all night, not because the boss was going to whip you if you didn't do it, but because you could not not do it. Yeah, exactly. I, I started smoking cigars. Uh, when I was writing the musical, the the second musical that I wrote, because I was up so late and then coffee and cigars, and I've developed a lot of bad habits because of my creativity. <laughs> um, uh, but I, but uh, working out those lyrics and working out the music that goes with it for me is is probably the 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 bell ringer uh, bliss thing for me. And I I'm having some distress because I'm not uh, you know my life is kind of full and I'm not doing it. So that's one of them. what keeps you up late. What do you find yourself doing anyway, <laughs> right? Yeah. The other one is people have told you, hey, you're pretty good at that. That's not a bad way to find your bliss also. You know, you've heard yeah. it. Maybe we don't think about it. We might have to do some writing about it. You know, Joe told me I was, you know, I was pretty good at caricatures that time. I remember, oh, and, and uh, Ethel told me as well. And I remember that teacher who, right? A lot yeah. of that stuff gets buried. We have to like bring it up again. Uh, and another way to find our bliss is through our projections, right? Who is the artist or singer or, or uh, architect or personality in the world that you hate the most? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, who do you judge the shit out of as a, as, as a creative person, right? They're too corny, maybe, or they're too... And that's a good way. There's something in there. Not to say that you necessarily need to do that art form, but whatever the projections are that we're doing toward, uh, you know, people hate Barry Manilow because he's so talks about love and stuff. I don't know. Why don't you like poor Barry and the carpenters? <laughs> These are what, what do they call them? Guilty pleasures or something like that. Yeah. Right. So what is that about that that brings up your shame? Right? Is it too vulnerable for you, or what is it? Right. So, and then the last piece about finding our bliss is uh, is the, the the people that you revere. Oh, I went. I saw Billy Joel at the F one 
uh, uh, concert uh, at the F F1 site here in Austin uh, last week. I don't care. I've seen him six times in concert. He's the poet of my generation. And there's people that my jazz file uh, friends look down their nose at that kind of street kind of uh, uh, poetry I wrote. But to me, he's telling my truth. He said, uh, uh, this is my life. Uh, what my favorite, my favorite quote of his is, uh, do what, do what's good for you or you're not good for anybody, James. I don't know. You know that song? It's not one of his main songs. I don't, but I, I like how much you like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, 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 isn't that what we're talking about here? Do what's good for you or, or you're yeah. not good for anybody. Half of his lyrics have shit like that on. I'm, I'm assigning you to go look through some of Billy Joel's lyrics. That guy yeah. uh, kind of had, uh, you know, had some opportunities and uh, to work through some of his own trauma. Yeah. You know, Brooklyn, Long Island, dealing with that kind of tough culture <clears throat> world. And I don't think his dad was in his life. He had to pull, he had to like pull up some bootstraps. And uh, so that's, a, and that's another way to find our bliss. Somebody you, who's whose creative expression just you admire too much like me right <laughs> with billy joel and uh or somebody you want to kill right because they're so corny or there's something wrong with them uh what people have told you you're good at uh and uh the things kept you up late at night and you just find yourself doing anyway it's important yeah. to find the to at least know what it is uh, so we can at least turn our scope a little bit toward it right I think that's right. And and I think maybe the next step after you've kind of identified what is that creative truth or or, or that I, that visionary idea of what you want for your life is, you know, trying it out by saying it out loud a little bit. Be, because a lot of times, you know, in my own experience, I've found that there's a ton of shame around what my real desires are. And, and I don't, I, I stay quiet about it be, because I don't want somebody to judge the things that I want for my life. And there's an opportunity to speak what we want out loud and to kind of go on the emotional roller coaster of that and notice what sensations come up in our body as we're, as we're talking to people about these things. And then spend some of that mindful 20 minutes a day really tuning into, oh, you know, when I, when I to told uh, Joe about you know, this thing I wanted to do, he looked at me funny and that didn't feel very good. And really feeling through some of that, that, that sensation, that discomfort is a, is a mapped trauma. And if we can feel through it, then we can feel more confident giving language to our desires and what we want. And the beauty is that when we can, without resistance, with it, without discomfort, when we can say the things that we want, that's where we engage a kind of universal teamwork where we start to draw in the people that can help us achieve that. That's right. Support. You just turned the corner to support, didn't you? Because yeah. it's like for all of this, all of the stuff, healing trauma, being on the creative path, getting sober, stopping and let it letting go of our dependencies and the, the other the many ways that we adjust our chemistry i have people in my office and the groups that i lead uh, say some version of this so uh, uh, so where do i start how do i begin how what do i do <laughs> and, and the, the the first answer is always with support yeah. that's where it has to start. if you're going to go do this shit on your own all right go ahead and try that and let, come on back and then let me know how that worked out <clears throat> Yeah. So let's get into a little bit, you know, what kind of group support looks like. Somebody may not be familiar with, with that kind of scenario. So maybe you can unpack what that is and, and why you feel it's valuable. And, you know, the, a lot of people that I speak to want to just do something they'd prefer to actually sit with themselves because it's really scary to, to have to sit with themselves in a group to be seen in their vulnerability and so maybe you can talk a little bit about why the group dynamic provides such a potent healing environment yeah well i don't know if you uh, noticed or not but you are not an island john you may look like an island of sorts, like you're completely all there by yourself. But I don't know if anybody told you, you're just a big chunk of vibration. You're just mm. vibrating. 
-hmm. And then all that air around you is vibrating. Those bookcases behind you, the wall, the light the, is vibrating. And then everything else on, in, in the universe is just vibration. There is nothing here. Uh, yeah. We, all it is, is the only reason I can't pass this hand through that hand is because there's a diff there are different vibrations. Yeah. But there is nothing. We are, we're, we're not really here. I know that's the woo woo, but it's not. It's it's quantum physics has snuck up on that as a uh, uh, as an actual equation. We, yeah. you know, you can look at the smallest thing that we're made out of. Uh, what is it? An atom? I suppose it's an atom, and uh, it, it, there, it's uh, it's all space. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing there, and that's what we're made of. I mean, isn't that just logical? We are made of vibration and space. Yeah. Therefore we are connected whether we want to like tell ourselves in this tiny little brain of ours that we're not connected that i'm isolated that uh uh you, you know just practically we are connected right so that's that's just that's just an underpinning scientific truth that, that overlaps with with uh, spirituality i mean the people before the quantum physicists have been saying it for thousands of years of course we are par all part of this big thing you know some people like to say god or there's there's probably more words for that entity the universe whatever it is than any uh, than anything else right except love yeah. and there's 79 words for love the things we can't explain uh we have to find many many different names for it just trying to approach it yeah. <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, most of us got wounded in groups, right, in our families, at school, whatever, we got shamed, you know, even not, not intentionally, we're not blaming anybody, we're all from good families. Thank you, mom. Thank you, dad. Thank you, you all did great. And uh, we like, I've wounded my daughter, I'm a create creativity guy and a healer and all this stuff and i know i have an attitude sometimes with her she told me when she got a bad grade i said well what are you worried about sweetie you're doing great all that and uh, she said well i'm really only worried about one thing what's that sweetie <laughs> your opinion about it mm. oh fuck yeah so whether you work really hard to not be like that or not we're all i come from from what i come from and i bring it in my body and um uh, my daughter's gonna have to do some healing around that right mm. and like i am we all carry uh and our immediate solution is let's stay away from people so it doesn't happen again yeah. and unfortunately uh as you'll find out if you were to join a psychodrama group or a bioenergetics group or an experiential therapy group of any kind you'll find uh, that that's kind of the deep end of the pool or if you come to the deep waters intensives or one of my groups uh, that we're doing uh, mostly on Zoom these days. You, it's a little bit about, that's a little deep end of the pool if you're brand new to the work. Uh, a, a shallower end of the pool is a 12-step is a group called uh, Adult Children of Alcoholics and Dysfunctional Families, which we're all from. Uh, please send me the email. If you're not from a dysfunctional family, I want to meet you. Uh, but that's a place where you can kind of stay a little bit isolated and be a little vulnerable, but you don't have to be vulnerable at all if you don't want to. And it's, it's fairly easy to find a meeting online. Uh, but the dynamic, here's the main dynamic. I hear you being vulnerable, talking about something, maybe you're not doing it perfect, and you're having a little bit of pain about it. And then suddenly, I have the ability to talk about my pain that I hadn't been up till then because it wasn't safe, at least psychologically, I didn't think so. But then in person with someone, when someone else, uh, I feel like I'm there with somebody that's been there, that's been through it, I can start talking about it. And mm. uh, it's not just uh, rhetoric here uh, that, that I'm putting out here about the importance of starting to talk about things that are emotional. It's physical, because something moves in me, and then maybe a tear starts to come. And that is the river that begins to heal our trauma, which yeah. will lessen the messages that have us blocked from living our bliss. It, it, it's, it's, it, why cheat yourself out of the very best way to get rid to, to uh, transform those, those lodged uh, uh, tr uh, traumatic uh, chunks that live in our body that are running our life? Why would we avoid the opportunity to fast forward that healing uh, space, which happens in groups? It's, yeah. You know, you can do it on your own. You can get the creative fire and hide in your bedroom and 
and, uh, you know, do the worksheets, but there's going to be a point in time when you're going to want to fucking connect with somebody. I promise you. That's right. And it's, it, it's deeper, faster in, in my experience. I mean, one, one of the beautiful things about being in a group where it's okay to be vulnerable is that when, when there are people that are seeing you as you really are and holding that space for you and making it known, you know, energetically, for lack of a better word, that it's okay to be whatever you need to be in that moment, that emotion just comes to the surface in a way that it, it can happen in, in an individual practice, but it really requires that you do a lot more of the a lot less, <laughs> like, you, you know, like, like the, the old a- adage, uh, everyone should meditate 20 minutes a day, unless you don't have 20 minutes, then you should meditate an hour. Like right. that's the kind of commitment that an individual practice requires. And group for me was always something where it was like, well, I don't trust myself to show up for myself, but, but I, I will show up for the group because I'm still working through some, some of the, right. the projections where I have to show up for others. And, and so I, I think what I always loved about the rooms in, in AA was that you would show up and, and there would be the same cast of characters, but then there would be a lot of new faces that you hadn't seen every single night. And you would get the message that you needed to get, or at least that was my experience. Like I always walked out of there like, wow, that, I can't believe that guy said that, that like that I needed to hear that so much. Yeah, And, and you know, that to me, it's kind of about bursting our own little bubbles that we've built around ourselves. We're so good at building these protective mechanisms where we don't have to interact with anything that's going to be uncomfortable. And when we lean out of that bubble a little bit, bit, there's so much healing that can happen at such an accelerated rate. And we can get data points and information that aren't available in our bubble. Really important points you just made. It's uh, the, for, for folks that are brand new at this, I always tell them go to six meetings because it won't be the bl- you won't be the blissful John that you're seeing here uh, at first. You're going to judge the shit out of everybody in the room. <laughs> and how That's almost different. part of the fun of it. <laughs> yeah. It's like, in, in fact, I tell, you know, some counselors say, go, go look for the, the uh, uh, similarities, right? I say, no, go have fun. I want you to pick out the people that you know you're not even close to, that you're not even like. You know, you don't have to be nice in your head <laughs> and yeah. these things. And, uh, but to get to six meetings, because by the sixth meeting, uh, that the shame that is driving the judgments <clears throat> has lessened, right? Yeah. And by then, maybe you've even said a couple of things in a meeting where you might even feel connected a little bit, right? It's very yeah. much, and, it, and it's very much uh, like exercise for folks that know about going to the gym. Oh my God, so much pain the first couple of times, right? Because it's you're using muscles you're not used to. And yes. it's going to feel the same way as we loosen our trauma. Uh, you know, all the substance abuse uh, uh, programs like AA, CA, NA, all those, they're fucking spectacular for stopping that putting that stuff in our bodies. It's in fact, the only thing that works for that. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not always that trauma informed. I mean, there's going to be guys in there say, hey, I don't care what you're feeling or what happened in your childhood. Just put that shit down and I'll meet you tomorrow. We'll talk more <laughs> about it. Right. And I, you know, I needed some of that tough love in the early, uh, uh, just to be, just to wake up from the, you know, medicating myself. Yeah. Uh, uh, but we're not necessarily going there to heal our trauma. Uh, and, but, you know, after a few meetings, you're going to pick out the people that you can, that you feel safe with, right? Just remember when we start going to these meetings, there's crazy people there. There's alcoholics and crazy people like me and John. <laughs> and uh, to expect it to be run perfectly is an expectation that will be dashed. <laughs> That's right. But with time, if you get to six meetings or so, uh, you'll find the rhythm. It's almost uh, universal. Yeah. And you can sit on the outskirts for a hundred meetings as, as many as you want, but, but there is a point in time where I didn't want to be involved at all. I wanted to, the first time I had to go was court ordered. So, so I was just on the outskirts, not participating at all. 
and there's an interesting moment where you almost feel called to share something and and it's it's almost like you have to vomit it out and and when that happened to me and then when it was received without judgment and and I was able to say it out loud they something shifted where all of a sudden like I was I wasn't on the outskirts anymore I was a part of this mechanism this organism that that was gathering naturally here and 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 it was it was a shift it was a a mindset and emotional heart state shift and that's really the only way to that I can explain it but but it was powerful and and it is something that I highly recommend anybody experience, experience. And, and, you know, if, if, if AA is, isn't your flavor, I, you know, I totally get that. It could be an improv theater class is almost the same type of experience. Right. And I, I've done both and I found them both to be incredibly valuable. Well, AA should be your thing if you're an alcoholic. I mean, if you know, you like put that poison in your body and can't stop or it's causing you problems, then AA probably the place you ought to go move through your resistance. Mm. <laughs> but there is a 12 step program for just about everything, including art. Uh, actually, I don't think art, uh, art synonymous is still cooking anyway, possibly in New York city, but uh, almost for uh, everything else. Um, yeah. and, of, and of course, uh, you know, if, if the 12 step thing, if you're afraid they're going to make you, say the word God, which they won't, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just a metaphor for getting connected versus being isolated, right? Uh, yeah. But if that's not your thing, you can find a good therapist. And I would recommend you find somebody uh, like if, if uh, a somatic experiencing therapist, that's a good thing to search because they will take you into your body, which is where the solution is, right? Yeah. Uh, also, uh, anybody that's trained in psychodrama or bioenergetics or core energetics or those folks that know about the uh, the, the 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 way that our that we get stuck that it's not just our brain. You know, most of psychology uh, is teaching that it's all about uh, cognition and behavior, and it is, but it's being driven by our unconscious lodged trauma in our body. Uh, anybody that's psycho, if you see the phrase psychodynamic, you know, you're at least with a practitioner who understands that the, the, the what's underneath the surface is what driving is what drive drives us right and yeah. uh, any anybody that has Jungian could uh, uh, Dr. Carl Jung in their in their uh, resume uh, are, are going to have that that orientation. And it's not, it, you know, it's it's not, I have a bias toward it, not just because uh, I intellectually think that it's more mature. <laughs> I, I've had 31 years of trying the, to think my way into better behavior or behaving my way into better thinking mm. over and over. And I just snap back to whatever the old wound is that is unhealed. And it yeah. takes a certain kind of ma mature mastery to facilitate that transformation. Mm. That leads me into something that you and I had had texted back and forth a little bit about, and and it's the concept of of letting go versus giving up, and and you know I think sometimes when you're in an AA meeting, there there can be a lot of talk about surrendering, and and if you're not used to that kind of language, it can feel like something that the warrior in you doesn't want to do, and. Maybe you can talk to me a little bit about the difference between letting go and, and kind of surrendering into a relief place versus giving up and, and kind of tossing everything away. Well, we only know this much. Anybody that's watching this on YouTube, it's like this, you can't even see it. We don't know much, right? So we're running on not knowing much. And if you want to know a little more, you better let go of the things that are keeping you in this little microcosm reality. Mm. And uh, it takes courage. It's vulnerable, right? The high, the, it takes way more courage to be vulnerable than it does to uh, be tough or to be have it all together. These things are easy, right? It's like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm fine. I'm good. That, you know, that's easy. Saying, you know, I'm really hurting right now. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sad about, uh, and I'll just say uh, one of my sponsees knew a 15-year-old girl who uh, died in a car wreck a couple of days ago and it just completely shattered mm. everybody's lives 
and slowing down enough right now for, to let myself feel that is not where I want to go. But I know that that is the doorway to opening up, knowing just a hair more about mm. the breadth of the world, the breadth yeah. of my world, practicing to allow myself to feel the full range of my life. Yeah. Surrendering to the river, because here's the deal. Almost everybody's trying to get happy, right? You ask them, what if you could get down to, well, I'm just trying to, I want to be happy in my life. I want you to be happy. We want, we all want to be happy. All right, whatever. I don't really use that word too much. I like the word joy because it uh, has a wider, uh, for some reason, something happen, happen, happens more deeply in me when I use that word. But I've, what I've realized that that the river of joy and grief are exactly the same river. You get me talking about this beautiful daughter of mine and uh, I, I'm laughing and crying at the same time. It's the same river. I miss her. She's in college. Where is she? And she's doing great. And I love her. And it's so good. So it's the, yeah. the ability to feel the full range of my life. Uh, I'm not there yet. You know, I, 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 I used to have this much consciousness and ability. Now I've, I've also, I don't recommend surrendering just uh, casually <laughs> usually yeah. we have to bump up against something right and, and 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 i'm a little older and it bumped enough now i can actually feel the bump mm. uh, you know life is saying wait a minute you might want to surrender a little bit and see what more is here mm. <laughs> right it used to take a major uh ex huge explosion of some kind in my life yeah ripping somebody out of my life or jail or uh, some disaster, right? Now it takes, it's like a little bit of a different kind of, I can take the nudge and sometimes say, all right, wait a minute, maybe this little bit of information that I have is uh, uh, not the whole, the whole uh, deal. Yeah, I think that's right. And I mean, the way that I've experienced in my own life is I've very much been in, in that kind of giving up place that that is like a toss off giving up like whatever yeah i'm done with it screw those people like it's it's a kind of, it's a kind of writing it off so you don't have to feel how uncomfortable it is mm -hmm. that that's not i don't think what what you're talking about when you're talking about surrendering and and letting go like letting go is really letting go of the resistance. It's yeah. not letting go of the situation. It's letting go of the resistance that prevents us from being even more present with the situation and perhaps the discomfort that's there and the vulnerability that's underneath that and oftentimes the sadness or grief. And, and my experience has been that when we can tune into that river that you're talking about, you know, that grief joy river, the, the experience is that the the brain fog that's preventing us from seeing things clearly and and knowing clearly what the next step is that starts to to diminish be because that brain fog is, is almost like a defense mechanism in my experience that that's saying don't look at that if we clear things up you're going to have to see something that you don't want to see before that's you can right. see the thing beyond that yeah. and my experience is always that if my brain is foggy, there's something to feel. And if I can get into my body, sit with those sensations for a long enough period of time and really be present with them and let the emotions flow out however they need to flow, the brain fog will disappear. I'll, I'll see on the m movie theater screen of my mind what I need to see. And it's usually something temporarily uncomfortable that I've been ignoring. I feel through that. And then on the other side of that are the next steps that help me choose something new beyond that. Yeah, it does. It's exactly right. The, uh, the, the, um, uh, the re resistance to feeling is what we're talking about here, but it's not just because I'm a bad person. He's resistant. He's a bad resistant person that Bob <laughs> bear. And, uh, we need to, uh, just, uh, uh, shame him and uh, send him messages that he's morally wrong because he won't feel. No, I have trauma that keeps me from, I have particular trauma around grief, right? I was the boys don't cry. That was a big deal for my dad. He, he, there was no space for him to cry as a kid. He didn't mm -hmm. cry till, till he was in his eighties, <laughs> you 
<laughs> you know, yeah. when he got really tired of holding that shit in. But anyway, I got a big dose of that. And boys aren't supposed to be scared either. This boy wasn't, I mean, I, I ain't scared of nothing. I heard my dad say it many, many times. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and a- anger, anger was okay sometimes, <laughs> but it was usually <laughs> of the rage type, right? So I, m- for the most part, emotions were not something that I practiced at all. I didn't have any way to let them out in a, in a, in a way where it wasn't like volcanic, mm. right? It's either rage, terror, or death defying pain, right? Mm. Just letting sadness come, having, have, being scared, you know, or just having some nervousness about a situation. I had to hide that. Uh, and, and, you know, wait a minute, this, I'm angry right now was these are, these were foreign concepts. So I grew up many years. It was 30, I was 35 years old before I got around. Anybody said, what are you feeling, Bob? I said, what, what are you talking about? It was absolute. So, yeah, of course we are good. It's going to feel like giant to invite me to feel it's under so much pressure. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's not you know for guys like you and me they've done quite a bit of this work. It's just like, what are you talking about? So, so you're sad. Good, bring it on, brother. You know, for me, before I knew it was okay, it felt like it was going to be the end of the world to bring that up. So yeah. we have to kind of just let the dam leak a little bit, and then get some affirmations and hang out with the right people. Here we are, winding right back to that original thing we started talking about. How do you do it with support? Yeah with the right kind of support, with somebody that can hold space without getting reactive. Because if I'm not doing my work, here's two here's two clues for all the topics we're talking about today. If I'm not doing my creative expression, I am not a safe person for you to be talking about your creative emergence or bringing mm-hmm. your new art to the... We, do not ask me to read your first draft. <laughs> I am the wrong person if I'm not doing my own creative expression, because I'll find everything that's quite wrong with this and I'll let you know about it Mm. or I'll, or I'll have a body posture about it. You got to make sure you bring it to somebody who's doing their own work and has been doing their own work and can hold space. The same thing is true for recovery from uh, self-medication of the many, many kinds that there are not just substance. and, And it's also true about healing trauma. You yeah. have to be with people that have some experience with it. Right? Yeah. So, otherwise, they'll get triggered. They'll shame you and put you put you know put us right back in the hole that we're trying to climb out of. Yeah, I think that's important to be sharing with people who are doing the same work and and uh, do doing their own work and and not just showing up as the critic. And you know, one thing that that we've talked a lot about in in this conversation is getting into the grief and and the sadness and and you know for for tough for tough guys that and and gals like that that can be a difficult thing to do but for people pleasers like me actually getting into the anger and 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 finding that that caliber of expression and, and and recognizing that it's okay for me to be angry or resentful about something and not always just take everything as a projection and and then blame myself for it. I think as a recovering people pleaser, they, there's always the tendency to just blame myself. Well, if I'd just shown up better and, and then I just choose out of the situation rather than having to deal with confrontation and, and, and sharpen the, the, the blade of the relationship a little bit. So can you talk a little bit about when it's appropriate to to be anger angry and and how group support can kind of give us the space to practice some of those angry feelings when when maybe I mean most of my life I I didn't really practice anger. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Well, you've been there, so you're acting like you don't know about it, but. Uh, John has done a lot of good, uh, John is a really nice guy who also has a lot of anger underneath the surface. And I, I happen to have the, the honor of being present when you got some of that out. Right. Cause, yeah. uh, you know, nice is not the whole story, right? right. <laughs> like right. nice is not even, I don't even, I don't even like it that much. Nice is sort of <laughs> eh, to me. I, I want something that smells authentic. Right. And I can, mm. sm- I can smell phony nice 
and uh, I can smell ad absolute authenticity, right? So the answer to when is it appropriate to be anger, angry is uh, just, it's not a great, that's not a great question. <laughs> it's like, anger is anger. I'm angry, I'm angry. There's not a question of whether it's appropriate or whether it's the right time or not. Now, in emotional intelligence, to be emotionally intelligent, which is the only phrase that you can use in the business world, by the way, I've found, to even let that feeling come into the room, because otherwise, you know, any feelings that come out in academia or in uh, in uh, any kind of large organization, there's somebody with a big broom is going to be chasing that feeling down the hall to try to stamp it out, right? But mm. just in recent years, you can you can use the word emotional intelligence and get away with it mm -hmm. um, because uh, it sounds uh, like some advanced thing that. Uh, and also, it's there's been enough press about it, and there's now there's enough research about it that shows that it that uh, emotional intelligence equates to productivity. Oh yeah, baby, they're gonna build shit for us if they're more emotionally intelligent. So <laughs> let's uh, let's make sure we let that in the door, okay? <laughs> right? So, but the the main to, the main uh, skill of emotional intelligence is the ability to identify feeling. <clears throat> mm. What am I feeling right now? Mad, sad, scared or joy, right? And the other one is to be able to have what's known as empathy, which, you know, it's not really something corporate America is probably that interested in, but it is a good skill set, even if it's manipulative to have a sense of what the other guy's feeling, right? <laughs> well, yeah. Let's see, wait a minute, he's angry right now. But most of us don't even have, don't even have access to our own emotional capacity. And if you don't have that, you don't have the ability to read the room <laughs> right? yeah. at all. So it, it's a useful tool. Uh, the, the third uh, skill of emotional intelligence is um, the ability to, what, what the, this is what I was trying to get to. The, uh, most of the models talk about regulation of emotion. And then there's the Baran uh, 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 model that talks a lot more about expression. So I think it's mm -hmm. both. It's uh, learning how to express our feelings appropriately, learning how to regulate it appropriately. They love that word there too, appropriate. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, uh, uh, and then the big the the the, the punchline is what your work is, which is mindfulness. It's about being present. Like you know, you can the way I talk about that is you run into somebody, you can see their personality is up on their skin. It's up on the surface of them, as opposed to where is that guy? I mean, you mm -hmm. spend a half an hour with him and, and never said anything that had any emotional resonance. Yeah. Right. So having presence. So those are the mm -hmm. four things. Knowing what I'm feeling, knowing what you're feeling, having uh, ex uh, the ability to express and uh, and uh, uh, presence. Yeah. And what I found is that the more that I have allowed myself to express that anger, the more that I'm able to hold space for others to do the same. And, you know, the I've heard that call, called um letting someone storm and and you're holding the space recognizing that they're just getting it out of, out of their system i guess my my question for you is when someone is being angry with you where does it cross a line where it it becomes a, a kind of abuse or, or trauma and how as mindful practitioners and coaches how can we hold that space but still draw a line when they where there's a clear boundary yeah so anybody that's been to a psychodrama uh weekend or one or to the braveheart experience or to uh the deep waters intensives that uh we do here uh, in any of these kind of uh, 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 or, or bioenergetics or core energetics or the who are those other uh, all the wild the wild people um, the uh, re uh, radical oh, oh I'll get it before this thing is over and I'll get it but that it's like anything goes there in other words these experiential programs that kind of came out of the encounter movement in Esalen of the 70s and now grown into a better organized uh, 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 strain of how to heal from uh, repressed emotions, uh, trauma. You know, at these things, you might 
uh, as you know, <laughs> you know, out of context, if I'm going to I'll tell you right now, somebody's going to listen to what I'm about to say, and they're going to say, oh, that's some, oh, that's all, we can't be doing that, or, or there, there will be somebody will get triggered. So I might be doing some work with you, and maybe you're playing some message that I carry, I might be saying, fuck you, God, I'm angry and screaming and maybe beating on something. And, and eventually yeah. I can get some of the top off of the volcanic pressure on the anger that I've been told was inappropriate in mm. so many ways. Yeah. Right. And, and it, but, it, but that is what we call ritual theater. Mm. It's a space that's been used since the Dionysian Dionysians up in the hills of the of Greece, <laughs> you know, a couple thousand years ago, we're doing this work. All tribal, uh, all uh, tra traditional cultures have some way to get that stuff out on a regular. We do not. We bottle mm. it up, box it up, and have no way except for these few little communities where it's appropriate. And of course, you know, I went to the Astros. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the baseball game and they do great and I get something out, but I'm not developing any, uh, through that. I'm not developing it. Uh, I'm not accessing my, uh, trauma. <laughs> so, so therefore I'm not making it me. I'm not making it part of me. I'm not bringing mm -hmm. my story, my wound, my story of my wound into the story of me, right. Yeah. Which, which makes it authentic. And so it's not, it's a, almost like crying on the, at, at the bar, with the bartender. Yeah, it's like really my life is shit. But then I wake up the next day and I haven't done anything, right? Yeah. Because I, it's not really integrating in my deeper soul. But at these, of course, at these weekends, we we get that anger up and out. And I have to say at the end of the men's weekends, we take quite a bit of time. I say, well, do I have your attention? I know you're in an altered state right now, <laughs> but it's not appropriate to go home to your spouse and say, fuck you, I'm angry. No. <laughs> It's not, yeah. not, let's not go to your boss Monday morning and say, I'm out of here. Fuck you. I just learned how to have my feelings. No, <laughs> no, we've got a, uh, that's for the ritual space. It's to get the top off of it. Uh, in 12 step recovery, we, and also if you get a good therapist or if you're in a community of folks that have an agreement and guys like you and I uh, can, you know, we've had a little bit of exchange recently where we found an appropriate way to say, you know, I'm frustrated right now. Yeah, um, I'm feeling I'm feeling some anger and sadness right now. We have a we have a, a language for that. and We don't need to like shame each other. Or, uh, you know, that's all I had before recovery was like, you know, I had to make the other person the wrong person and call them names, at least in my head or outwardly. Um, that's all I had. But now we yeah. have some other tools. It is okay to be angry. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be scared. And we have to practice it and hang out with people that are that are in in, in that are okay with that. And I'm I'm just telling you, they're not in every corner. You're gonna have to seek it out. <clears throat> yeah. I think that's right. And and setting the ground rules, I think, is what I, I heard you say. When you, so when you're in a group, they there's kind of a group agreement that, hey, this is how this is going to play out. And so everybody is raising their hand to that experience. And and I think that kind of container is what I've heard it called, can can be built in a romantic relationship or with a best friend or in a business right. environment. But the container is basically setting the rules of how moving forward now right now while i'm not angry let's set the rules for what it will look like when i am yep. is language, that accurate absolutely language is powerful in those circles we have a thing called the clearing model where you say what you're feeling mad sad glad scared what happened to get giving the data what's the judgment and what do you want right it's a little container for saying the whole thing without mixing up my judgments with my feelings Mm. I'm not, I'm not going to launch into that right now, but it's very easy to judge folks by <laughs> and call it a feel. I feel like you're, uh, <laughs> I feel like you're uh, hurt, hurt. That's not a feeling you're judging me right now. Right. <laughs> so, but there's there's language and it takes some training. This is not, uh, you know, I've worked with, <laughs> there's a couple of companies I worked with uh, a few years ago that were uh, construction workers turned in, uh, turned executives Great guy, great bunch of guys. They're all, if anybody knows about the Berkman uh, personality instrument, they were reds, meaning after every sentence, one of them would say, well, what do I do? No, no, brother, I'm just inviting you to feel what you're, what you're feeling about that. Okay, well, so what do I do about it? 
<laughs> it's like, um, so, you know, we have to develop these, the, the, these, <laughs> the, these skills and it takes practice and I had to actually give them the script, try saying this and it will, and it actually resonates in a feeling way in the body. But if you mm. don't know how to do it, and if you're not around anybody that's doing it, it's going to sound like some really weirdo shit. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, uh, but yes, there, and, and the same thing is uh, like the Harville Hendricks model of uh, couples therapy, which I use when I'm working with couples, very specific uh, dialogue model where we use the when you I feel model, which is uh, better than the you son of a bitch model. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm not against a good argument, but let's at least build a container around. It. Yeah, so can, uh, maybe, maybe even get some validation and some empathy happening with the people closest to me in my life. <clears throat> yeah. That's interesting. And, and it reminds me that one of the reasons to go and work with a professional therapist or to get into some group therapy is to kind of learn the template for setting those. And, and, you know, I've, I've heard that in romantic relationships and marriage, the time to engage with a therapist is before you're angry at each other, like, like setting that groundwork and, and having a framework where, you know, okay, if we get in a fight, which eventually we're going to, this is the framework where we're going to go and we're going to yeah. talk to Dr. Bob and, and, and work it out through the, this agreed upon framework. And I think that can make it a lot easier to step into that space when both people have a lot of heat in them. Yeah, the, the book is called Getting the Love You Want by Her uh, Harville Hendricks. Mm. Strongly recommended for anybody, period, but anybody in relationship that might be struggling. Uh, the, uh, the, and, and the model loops right back to uh, the, our work, right? So what, what the, most of my arguments with the people closest to me are due to unresolved trauma that in the Imago piece is uh, you'll see on the, on the front of the book, it so, shows one face like a puzzle piece that fits into the other, to mm. the other partner. Cause that's what we do. We unconsciously choose somebody. Mm. Uh, not at first, first of all, we're the oxytocin is really rolling. So we don't see any of this, but we choose somebody who has the attributes of our original wound uh, caregiver, right. In mm. a lot of ways. Uh, 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 and, and they trigger the shit out of our earliest stuff, right? And so, therefore, you're either going to, you know, I don't know, what, what's the percentage of divorce? Like 50% or more than that or something? I don't Probably know what more. it is, but it, it's high. You got that choice. Get that, get him out of here. Get her out of here. Mm. I'm done, right? And then get married five more times to the same archetype <laughs> until... <laughs> We realize, so, so with the Imago mo model, what we, if you follow through and do the whole process, we become each other's healer because there's nobody better positioned to help me heal than my partner who's triggering the shit out of me. If, if that person will stay there and just hold space because I can find, heal the little boy in me that's projecting all this shit. Mm. It's nothing to do with us. Yeah. Nothing. It's like, that's what I tell people, uh, couples when they come into my office. I want to dispel a myth that I know you have. And I, I, I know you think I'm here to help you guys get back together. Yeah. It's not what I'm here. I'm going to help you find, get yourself together. And then maybe you can clear this, your own personal screen just enough to look at this person across from you and, and, and maybe see if you want to be in relationship with this person mm. <laughs> right now. You can't see shit. Yeah. You're, all you can see is your unresolved stuff that has been stirred up and is right in your face. Uh, yeah. Very difficult work to do. A lot of people aren't willing and thank God there's kids. That's if it wasn't for the kids, I wouldn't have stayed in. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, yeah, that's, that's some powerful work. And that same model can can be used. Actually, Harville Hendricks uh, has expanded that model to community uh, working out community conflicts mm. uh, uh, it's pretty strong stuff. So tying this back to where we started, which was the, you know, how do I find fulfillment and, and meaning, you know, I think that you and I doing this work that we've been, that we've been talking about um, throughout this conversation, 
that has gotten us closer to a kind of truth and a, and a kind of breadcrumb map that feels meaningful. And we're at least getting more and more tastes of that in, in our life. Can you maybe put a bow on this conversation and talk about how this work points to kind of uncovering what that um, place of fulfillment is going to be in your life? Uh, yeah, I'm still looking for it. I'm a little bit older than you. And uh, uh, my daughter kind of rung my bell this afternoon with that. It's like fulfillment. Yeah, am I fulfilled? Mm. I don't even know. But then I found out what she was really talking about was being pulled forward by our spiritual vision, yeah. as opposed to making myself do. That's the, to me, that's the tipping point right there. When I'm, when I'm, because uh, the book that I'm writing, uh, that should be there should be a button for that soon uh, is uh, stop doing shit. You don't want to do how unresolved trauma is running our lives. Mm. Uh, the tipping point of that is of course, there's going to be a few things that we don't want to do in our life, but most of us are walking around unconsciously doing shit. We think we're supposed to do. Yeah. The tipping point is, yeah, I'm doing a few things, but it's on my, I'm being pulled. I'm being, I'm, I'm being called right? It's yeah. almost like a calling. Uh, because we are built as human beings, even though manifest destiny is not a very pretty picture in the way <laughs> we have a we have a a, a a manifest destiny to grow, we are built to grow, right? We're like a tree, yeah. the trees are going to yeah. grow, we're going to keep growing psychologically everything. So when we plateau, it's not it's okay to rest for a while, but we're going to have that need to grow, right? And yeah. We want to grow toward our, our authenticity as opposed to growing toward our driven, uh, unresolved trauma that's telling us what we should do. It's that's the right. hardest work we'll do in our life, becoming fulfilled and, yeah. and being fulfilled, being full and filled with, it's a, you know, it sounds corny, but it's a spiritual, <laughs> filled with spirit, right? Filled yeah. with a soulful magic mm. uh, that, that brings us toward our authenticity in the world will and the world will be a better place. Some shit like that, right? The world will be a better place for it. If, uh, if I'm not doing battle within me, I won't be creating battles out here. I think that's probably a pretty good equation also. All right. Yeah. I think that's a good bow. And, and I guess my, my final tag to that would be, you know, the experience that I had for many years after white knuckling my sobriety was that I felt like a robot and I felt like I was starting to experience life in, in a kind of black and white numbed out way. And the beauty of getting into some of that sadness and grief was that the color came back online and I could see that full spectrum. And that full spectrum is not always sunshine and roses, but it's fucking beautiful at every point. And I think that for me, that is the fulfilling thing is being able to see with that kind of vivid clarity. Mm, nice. So with that, Dr. Bob, thanks for being here with me and, and being in conversation. If you heard anything that resonates, I would encourage you to check out deepwatersrecovery.com. We've got all kinds of tools and resources that live there for you to dip your toe into the water or dive right into to some of this work. And if you're curious what I'm up to, you can go to awaken-entrepreneur.com. I'm John Ray, Dr. Bob Bear with Deep Waters Recovery. Thanks for being here. And for those of you who stayed this long, we'll see you in the next one. Bye.